Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Megan Brown with the Northwest Rett Syndrome Association. As part of our mission statement, we like to attempt to provide advocacy resources to our members. And so today we have Adrienne with us for Advocacy with Adrienne. Um, Adrienne Stewart is a civil rights advocate in Washington State, and she is also a mom to Jack and Charlie. So thank you very much, Adrienne, for being here, and the mic is yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining, uh, whether you're joining now or you're listening to the recording later on, uh, please let me know how I can be a resource to you um, for uh, not only this training topic, but others. Again, as Megan said, I'm um, thrilled to be here. I will um, be as accessible to you as I possibly can. I am a mom and a parent, um, or I'm a parent and a sibling to two fabulous people with Rett syndrome. So this, um, this group is near and dear to my heart and I really uh, love this topic and this mission. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, with that, I'll get started. I will say that um, we're gonna do our best to hold questions uh, toward the end, but if you have a clarifying question, um, please do pop it into the chat. Megan's going to be monitoring the chat box um, both here on the uh, Zoom call uh, webinar right now and in the Facebook Live recording as well. <clears throat> okay. So um, again, my name is Adrienne Stewart and I um, am, am so thrilled to be here. I am the uh, Public Policy Director for the Developmental Disabilities Council here in Washington State. And I'm just gonna go through um, the basics of what you need to go to get started in your advocacy journey. Um, and typically when I'm doing this uh, training in person, I like to go through a healthy round of introductions. Um, I'm just going to go through this really quickly, um, but I would love to know um, for, for you all, who are you and how did you get here today? And I would love it if you would pop your answer into the chat box so that I know um, afterward who joined us today and um, if you have any follow-up questions, I would love to hear about them. For me, um, I am, uh, like I say, mom to Jack, who's six years old, and I'm also a twin sister to Haley, um, down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, I was uh, born as a silent, unaffected carrier of Rett syndrome, so I uh, my twin sister uh, was affected with Rett syndrome and my also passed it along to my son. Um, so as a lot of folks in our community know, that's a really rare thing to have happen. Um, but for a variety of uh, personal reasons, I've been thrust into a world of advocacy and trying to make systems um, better and more responsive to people with disabilities and their families. Um, so I've grown up in this community and, and marinated in um, a, a lot of the issues that families face, um, but, you know, both in my childhood and now on the other side of it as a parent. How did I get here today? Well, the Developmental Disabilities Council um, is uh, there's a, a DDC in every state across the country. You've got one in your state. And if you need help looking it up, let me know. Um, but uh, the, the Developmental Disabilities Council um, is, uh, uh, can, was born out of Public Law 106. That's a federal law. And basically it gives us the mandate to say, hey, um, you need to have folks in your state who are responsible for building capacity and for educating not only policymakers, but um, uh, inviting family members and people with disabilities to come together and try and uh, make systems more responsive um, and, and better funded for people with developmental disabilities and their families. Um, just a quick note on language. I will be using, for the most part, people first language. 
uh, throughout this training. I want to acknowledge that there are um, folks out there who feel strongly that um, identity first language, so um, uh, it is more appropriate for them. I want you to use whatever language is um, appropriate for you and, and fits best for you. So whether it's people first language or identity first language, I just want to acknowledge that um, there are those two streams of thought and <clears throat> I, want to, I want to honor what's best for you. Um, so I do public policy work for the Developmental Disabilities Council. And like I say, I'm supposed to educate policymakers and advocate um, for funding and systems that promote independence and support for people with disabilities and their families. Um, one, uh, one thing I will say is that the Developmental Disabilities Council is pretty um, strong and adamant that people um, with disabilities should be um, really well supported in their homes and not sent away to institutions, okay? Um, so that is a defining feature um, that sets us apart from some other groups. And I'm accountable to a governor appointed council made up of um, people with disabilities and their families. And this is the same all across um, the country. There's a DDC in every state. Um, so quickly going through some learning objectives. At the end of this primer, I hope that you'll be able to know what legislative, leg, legislative district and congressional district you live in. Um, you'll know how to look this information up if you forget it. You'll know your legislative and congressional representatives and how to connect with them. You'll also know which be able to look up which committees your legislators serve on, know what those committees do, and also know why it's important to tell your story and how to do it with purpose and persuasion. So I like to start with what I know. And um, the main thing that I want you to know today is that you come here with an expertise already within you. You are the subject matter expert of your own story. And that's critical for you to know because a lot of people feel intimidated or nervous about getting involved in advocacy work because they think that they need to know more than they already do right now. But as, as loved ones, as caregivers, as people with disabilities, you understand intimately the barriers that you face on a daily basis. And that, that expertise needs to get reflected back to the policymakers who may not know that they are creating barriers for you and your family. Okay, so if you take nothing else away from this training today, I really want you to know that you are the subject matter expert of your own story and you are ready to get involved in advocacy work, okay? So with that, um, I like to orient us to where we are and help us kind of understand how legislators think when we contact their offices. Now, um, just to back up really quickly, I will say, just remind us that there's the legislative, executive, um, and the uh, judicial branches um, in our government, okay? And so today we're gonna be focusing on just the legislative branch and advocacy um, with the legislative branch. There's absolutely important advocacy work that can and does happen at the executive level uh, or with the executive branch and with the judicial branch. But right today, we're just gonna focus on um, legislative advocacy and specifically in Washington state. But if you are listening from another state, a lot of this information is absolutely translatable to where you live. <clears throat> um, so um, I've included a few maps here. One is the map of the earth to remind us that we are um, small <laughs> in the scheme of things, um, but also uh, a legislative district map that um, I'm gonna show you how to find this. I usually do these trainings from the SeaTac airport. So um, some of my examples in here, like the address 
um, is going to be at CTAC, but you're going to be able to use your computer to type in your own address, okay? Um, and so if, if you're following along at home or if you're watching this recording later, feel free right now to toggle over to a browser and just type in leg.wa.gov. And then you're gonna um, scroll down um, and click on that uh, hyperlinked button that says find your district, okay? Um, and this is, it's really important for you to know your legislative and your congressional district. District boundaries are drawn every 10 years based on the census reports. And so when you're talking with a legislator, it's important for you to know whether or not you are their constituent. If you are the constituent, a person in their district who votes for them or doesn't vote for them, um, then um, they, they, they are typically going to want to uh, be especially receptive to your message, right? Because um, they want to make their constituents in their district happy with them so that you will continue electing them to office. <clears throat> this is true at both the, the state level and the federal level. Okay, so once you have found ledge.wa.gov and you click on find your district, you're going to be able to put in your address into the district finder, and then you can be able to find your district. And again, um, the example that I use, I was in the SeaTac airport, and so I just popped in the SeaTac address. And um, down here at the bottom, you can click find my district, and you're either going to look for the legislative or the congressional district. And you know, ideally you would know both. We are talking today about the state legislature, um, but a lot of this information is absolutely relatable to congressional advocacy work as well. Um, so you, uh, this is just a for instance, okay? So the, the legislators that I've got, a, a couple examples here, um, and District 33 is where the SeaTac Airport is. Um, so I have three legisl state legislators there. Um, I have Karen Kaiser, Senator Karen Kaiser, Representative Tina Orwell, and uh, Representative Mia Gregerson. Okay. Um, and at the um, congressional level, it looks like I'd be in District 9, if that were my address. And I'd have Senator Maria Cantwell, Senator Patty Murray, and Representative Adam Smith representing me in Congress in Washington, DC, okay? So it's important to know who works where. Um, your congressional representatives are going to be able to help you generally with federal um, laws and, and issues and barriers, and um, your state legislators are going to be able to help you with your state laws, rules, and barriers that you're experiencing. Okay, so I just want to take um, a quick check in here to make sure that everybody understands um, the website that you'll find your elected officials at, uh, which legislative and congressional district you live in. If you didn't know that information now, um, please make sure that you know it by the time that you're done with this uh, webinar. Um, if you need help, if you still need help, please uh, feel free to chat Megan in the chat box um, and we can go back and make sure that uh, folks, folks have that information. Um, so now you know who your legislators are in Olympia and you know who your congressional representatives and senators are in Washington, D.C. Megan, was there any chats that came up that said that they had trouble finding their electeds? Not yet. I just put the Washington address into the Zoom chat and I will look up Oregon and Idaho and Alaska's and add them also. Oh, thank you. I appreciate You're that. Welcome. Great. Very good. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, when trying to help our loved ones, we need to know how laws are made. Laws are made by people and not all people have all the information they need to make laws that work for all people. And there's a typo there, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, 
you know, this is, that is the most simple way that I can put to you to uh, plead with you to get involved in advocacy work. Um, people, it, it, people like you and me, regular people are elected to go to Olympia or to go to Washington DC to make laws and, um, and to fund budgets that uh, affect all of us. And so if they don't know about our issues or the barriers that we are experiencing, then they can't address them, okay? And if we don't know who our legislators are um, at the state or, or, or federal level, then we can't hold them accountable, right? Um, so it's, an, it's really critical that we um, take an interest in this work. So now that you know who your legislators are, let's get started. Um, I am going to, oh shoot, I think I, I need to stop sharing for just a second, Megan. I'm really sorry. I forgot to push the button to, um, to have the sound, um, to make the sound go. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I put the, Oregon and Idaho links in. I will add the Washington link and I'm grabbing the Idaho link right now for people to look up their legislators also. Thank you. So, so that you don't have to listen to me this entire time, I've invited some folks to help um, give you little clips about uh, why, why and how you should get involved in advocacy work, okay? And the first one comes from Senator Emily Randall who uh, serves us in the 26th legislative district here in Washington state. Um, so I'm gonna click on her, um, her video here and take you to it. Hi, I'm Senator Emily Randall and I'm coming to you from my front porch stoop in Bremerton, Washington. I represent the 26th Legislative District, which is Bremerton, Port Orchard, Gig Harbor, and the Key Peninsula. And I'm here to talk to you about how a bill becomes a law. Number one, identify your problem. This should be a common problem that you wanna solve that doesn't just impact one person, but a number of people. But I'll fill you in on a secret. If you're facing a problem, chances are your friends and neighbors are facing something similar. So stay connected with groups like DDC and the Ark of Washington to make sure that you know um, when you're, you share a problem with others. Number two, find your helpers, otherwise known as your coalition. This includes those organizations I mentioned, also PAVE, Parent to Parent Coalition, etc. Other friends and neighbors who are experiencing the same problem and folks who care about you and folks impacted by the problem. Those are your allies. You can also look for organizations that may not share the same priority, but who um, have some overlapping interest and you need at least one legislator. Number three, draft your bill, AKA the solution to your common problem. You do this in cooperation with your helpers and with your legislator. The legislator will direct nonpartisan staff, SCS in the Senate or OPR in the House, to write the official language. Once the language is right, or as close to right as you can get, it goes in the hopper. From there, a bill will be assigned to policy committee either health and long-term care, human services, transportation, it depends on what the bill is about. However, if it's just about money, rates or investments, it passes go and goes straight to the fiscal committee, ways and means in the Senate and appropriations in the House. In the policy committee, a bill needs uh, to be scheduled for a public hearing where there is testimony from folks like you and then scheduled for executive action where the committee votes on the bill. Next, if the bill costs enough money, it goes to the fiscal committee. Again, ways and means in the Senate and appropriations in the House. Like in the policy committee, the bills need to be scheduled for a hearing and then scheduled again for a vote in executive session. Bills that don't cost too much money go straight to rules. 
In the Rules Committee, this is sort of like the waiting room before bills move to the House or the Senate floor. You want to ask a member of the Rules Committee to pull your bill. That means take it out of the Rules Committee and move it for availability for scheduling on the Senate floor. Number seven, floor vote and debate. Once a bill is scheduled on the Senate floor, um, members of the legislature in whichever chamber it is, the House or the Senate, can debate on and vote on the bill. This needs to be done by the House of Origin cutoff. After that, if your bill passes, it goes to the other chamber and does the process over again. Scheduled for policy committee, scheduled for fiscal committee, sent to rules and pulled to the chamber floor for a vote. Only after that happens can the bill be signed by the governor. There are some other options, such as if the bill is changed um, in the second chamber, then it has to go back to the original chamber to be up or down voted again. Hope that was helpful and always happy to um, answer more questions. Feel free to email me at emily.randall, E-M-I-L-Y dot R-A-N-D-A-L-L at ledge.wa.gov, L-E-G dot W-A dot G-O-V. Okay, if anybody's feeling lost after Senator Randall just gave a uh, tutorial on how a bill becomes a law, that's okay. Remember I said at the beginning of this primer that you come with, uh, you, you come to this work already having the subject matter expertise of your own story. And so understanding how to weave that into uh, bill making processes or rule making rules or what have you, is just the next step, okay? But I don't want you to feel intimidated um, or overwhelmed after hearing that overview of how a bill becomes a law, but I do think it's a great um, overview. And so thank you so much to Senator Randall for sharing that tutorial with us. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay. Um, so uh, you will, when you heard Senator Randall talking about committees, <clears throat> um, it's important to, uh, to understand what those committees are and what they do um, and understand what um, the legislators positions are and whether they're in the majority and the minority. And the great thing about our website here in Washington state is that that information is already really clearly laid out for you. Um, so for instance, you'll see here, these are hyperlinks um, that I can click, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, that I can click on. Um, I can click on Karen Kaiser, Tina Orwell, or um, Nia Gregerson and get all the information that you need to, to, um, to understand. <clears throat> who your legislators are. So if we look at Senator Karen Kaiser, we know she's a senator because it gives us that little title right here. There's only one senator in every legislative district and there's two representatives in every legislative district. In Washington state, there's 49 legislative districts, okay? Um, so we've got Senator Karen Kaiser here, and when you click on that page, and again, you can do this for any senator that is representing you, we will see that she right now is the chair of the Labor and Commerce Committee. She's the vice chair of the Rules Committee. What's that? Um, she's also on the health and long-term care committee, and she's just a regular member of those because there's no title behind her committees. And she's also on the Ways and Means Committee. Now, these there's a couple committees in here that you might not uh, know what they do, okay? Um, but we're going to, as you can see, each of these committees are hyperlinked. So we can click on those committees to figure out exactly what they do, but before we move to that, 
Um, I want to just point out that um, everything else in here is really important as well. If I click on the 33rd legislative district, that'll give me the district map of, um, of where Senator Kaiser represents. I can click here on the email hyperlink that will take me directly to a page to email Senator Kaiser. I can click on her homepage if I want to understand and learn more about Senator Kaiser. I can also click on details, which will take me to, among other things, her voting record. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of those, but I do just want to make sure that you feel comfortable just clicking through there, exploring the information available to you. And again, reaching out to me if you've got any questions about how to access this information. But for right now, let's um, click through and see what we can learn about committees. Um, the committees, uh, and, oh, and this is Senator Randall, so same thing, um, chair the Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee, Health and Long-Term Care, she's the vice chair, and she's also on transportation, which is a big issue in her district. Um, so figuring out what the committees do is really important because if you have an issue that you care about, such as a transportation issue, a lot of people with disabilities rely on access buses, for instance, to get to medical appointments, um, to get to jobs, to go recreate or what have you. Um, when funding gets cut to transportation, a lot of times the first place it comes from is those um, buses that help people with disabilities get to where they need to go. And that information needs to be relayed back to legislators um, to let them know that this is a really important um, uh, service that people rely upon to fund. So again, all of these um, uh, committees are, everything here is hyperlinked. So just for instance, um, Senator Kaiser uh, serves on the Labor and Commerce Committee and she's in the Senate. Um, and these committees don't have to look the same in, in the Senate and the House, okay? Um, but here is a brief description of what the Labor and Commerce Committee considers um, issues relating to employment standards, industrial insurance, unemployment insurance, and collective bargaining. The committee also considers regulation of business and professions and has oversight of commerce issues relating to alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and gaming. And you can also, again, this is hyperlinked, click on committee schedules, agendas, and documents to learn more about what that committee is uh, undertaking. Now, uh, a lot of times people will see the rules committee and think that that's just kind of a boring committee that talks maybe about the rules of the legislature, what have you. But the Rules Committee, if you have a legislator who serves on the Rules Committee, you should know that's a really powerful committee. The Rules Committee considers all bills uh, reported from policy and fiscal committees and determines whether and in what order to schedule their consideration on the Senate floor by the full Senate. And there's the same Rules Committee in the House. So if somebody's on the rules committee, that means they sit on a committee that decides whether or not your bill is going to advance to the legislature at all. So that means it could have gone through a policy committee, it could have gone through a fiscal committee, but a lot of bills actually die in the rules committee, okay? So if you have a legislator that is serves on the rules committee, just make a mental note of the fact that that's a really important committee for you. Okay, just checking in and making sure, Megan, that people are following along okay. We have learned how a bill becomes a law. Uh, we've heard, uh, we know how on which, um, we know how to figure out on which your committees, which committees your legislator serves and you know how to research the scope and role of those committees. Are there any clarifying questions, Megan, that you feel I need to stop and address? Uh, we have not received any questions yet, so it seems okay. like everybody so far is following along okay. This is great. I'm so excited because everybody that is watching is going to immediately start their advocacy efforts right after uh, the completion of this 
um, training. So this is really exciting. I'm thrilled. Okay. Um, so uh, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about um, and again, you are the subject matter expert. You have all that you need to get started in your advocacy today, okay? Um, but, and really quickly, I just wanna throw a pitch in for why do this work? Um, this, this data was pulled from the um, PDC here in our state. And just to show you, there are 21,559 people um, in Olympia uh, who do this work. So it's important that we are down there because lots of other people are down there as well, making their case for why they need funding, why they need you know, policy changes or rule changes or what have you. Okay, here's my call, a picture of my colleague, Ivanova Smith, who is a frequent visitor uh, to Olympia and um, she's a disability rights advocate and activist and I'm honored to serve alongside her in, in so many ways. Um, and she's really great at telling her story. Um, and um, so I have another clip from Representative Frame out of the 36th Legislative District. And she's going to talk a little bit about why it's important for people to tell their stories. Hi, everyone. Oh, wait, did I share? I didn't. Sorry. West Sorry. corner of the city of Seattle. I wanted to take a, a couple minutes today oh to talk to you fine. about how important. Sorry about that. Adrian, I think you need to share the video again. I'm sorry, what was that? I think you need to share the video again. We can see you, but we don't see oh, the video. Oh, I'm the clip. so sorry. Yeah, you got to tell me that. Don't let me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought I. That's okay. I, can you can you see it now? I I hit share screen. Um. There. Okay. It's loading up. Can you see it now? Hi, everyone. Yes. My name is Noelle Frame. I'm the state it? representative for the yes. 36th district, which is the northwest corner of the city of Seattle. I wanted to take a, a couple minutes today to talk to you about how important it is to tell your stories to legislators when you want to make change in the world and in our state, um, and how to come talk to us, whether it's in person in Olympia, um, through an email, over the phone, maybe it's in a video call, um, why it's so important for you to tell us your stories. For me as a legislator, there's a lot of need out there and a lot of um, competing interests for our time. And sometimes it's, it's hard to pick priorities, but hearing stories from people about what they're actually experiencing really helps us to understand the real life impacts of the decisions that we make. And so, I have had a lot of really great experiences with people telling me, for instance, hey, you know, I have access to this healthcare for workers with disabilities program, but if I get a raise, I'm gonna lose my healthcare. And so we need to not have a cap on how much money we can make in order to have healthcare through that program. I never would have known that if my constituent, Joey Wilson, hadn't told me about that. And because he told me, we were able to get that changed and now there isn't a cap anymore. Um, I had another constituent um, that told me about how some, we have workers with disabilities that 
are actually paid less than the minimum wage. I didn't even know that. Um, but he helped me understand that. And then we brought it to the legislature and we took a big first step in making sure that the state as an employer wasn't paying less than minimum wage to members of our community who have disabilities. Um, these are really good examples of just basic stories that people told me where these folks, they didn't understand every last detail of the law. They didn't understand necessarily how the entire process worked. I will tell you that they got to know the process um, once they told me their stories and we worked together. But you shouldn't be intimidated by telling us your stories and not feeling like you don't know enough. You don't have to know everything. You just need to be able to tell us what's happening to you in your life and what you need help with and what you want changed. And then we will work together to figure out how we actually make that change possible. So I'm really hoping that you will continue to talk to your legislators, whether I'm your legislator or you talk to other people in your community um, and tell us what you need, ask us for help, and then tell your stories to other legislators so they too can understand the impact that their decisions make and how they can change the lives of people in the state of Washington. So thanks so much for your involvement and thanks to so many of you who have already worked with me on making major change. We really appreciate it. Okay, that was a uh, representative framed as a fabulous job of being accessible to people um, in the legislature. So thank you so much to her and her fabulous staff for um, making that video for us. <clears throat> Sorry that you were watching me drinking. Um, I didn't know that the video wasn't playing because I'm not a pro at this just yet, but um, okay. I'm gonna share my screen again. And so now that you know why it's important to share your story, I wanna go briefly through um, some things to keep in mind when you share your story, okay? Um, so first of all, um, you know, there's no right way, uh, there's no manual really on, on how to do this. Um, so we kind of just have to trust our instincts and our intuition and think about the fact that we're communicating with people, with busy people, um, who, um, again, you, since you are the subject matter expert of your own issues, might not have all the information they need to be helpful, okay? So um, communicating our issues to folks in a way that's um, helpful is uh, to them and, and it's easy for them to digest is gonna be helpful for us too. So um, a quick cheat sheet here, yeah. or I say orient yourself to the elected official, and I'm gonna go through these and explain these, okay? Uh, legitimize and synthesize your power. Uh, state the problem, ideally clearly and succinctly. Describe what happens if the problem goes unsolved. Answer your own question or come with your own solutions. Um, and leave the door open for follow-up. Those are some things that I try and keep in mind when I'm communicating with legislators. So orienting myself to the elected official, this means explain where you fit into the community. Um, are you a constituent? Do you live in that district? If you're not a constituent living in the district in which, you're, uh, in which the legislator, legislator you're talking to represents, um, it's important to know why you're talking to them. Are they the chair of a committee that you care about? Um, are they you know, on the rules committee? The rules committee, you need to talk to everybody on the rules committee, because again, they're part of the rules committee, which decides whether or not any bill goes forward. Um, but I also consider these other labels. For instance, um, are you a renter? Are you a homeowner? Are you a disabled person? Are you a church member, a parent? an employee, a voter, a pedestrian, a bus rider, whatever it is, um, orient yourself to the person, to the, to the legislator that you're speaking to. Um, and, and do this with you know examples and descriptors that you feel comfortable with. You don't need to feel like you have to tell them everything, <laughs> all of your um, 
you know, the, the categories that you fall into, but just enough so that they understand uh, who it is they're speaking to. So for instance, um, if you're new to an elected person, orient them um, such, uh, if for instance, that my name is Adrian and I'm a parent and a sibling to two disabled people. Sorry for the typo there. Um, my name's Adrian and I'm a homeowner in the 27th legislative district. My name is Adrian and I'm a homeowner in the 27th legislative district and a parent to a first grader who relies on state and federally funded services to live. Okay, so you can, you can look at kind of the merits of each one of those and these are just examples but whatever you um, decide, just find a sentence or two that fits for you. Um, what is, you know, what's going to be relevant to this person it, it, and, and consider the topic that you are discussing. Um, if, if I want this legislator to know that, hey, I, I live in your district, I pay property taxes, um, you know, I want you to listen to me because, you know, I have a lot vested into my community um, uh, th then that's what I want to convey. And if I also want to say, hey, you know, I've got a first grader, schools are closed right now. I'm going to talk to you about how, um, you know, since schools are closed and I can't get uh, services for my kiddo, the impact that's going to have on me um, and my family. Um, certainly, obviously, you know, a lot of us are um, advocating on behalf of our kids or a loved one who can't um, do it for themselves. And so you wanna make sure that you are centering their story as well in whatever message you're giving to um, an elected official. Legitimize and synthesize your power. Um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about and think about power in our communities, um, we need to make sure that, again, that the legislator understands that we're speaking with authority on the issue. And the first thing I told you when we started this training is you are the subject matter expert of your own story. Okay, so legislators might get reports from state agencies that, uh, you know, everything is, everything's hunky dory, you know, people are getting all the services that they, they, that they need. Um, there's no unmet need out there and, you know, everybody's happy with their services. But legislators need to hear from the people who are actually receiving those services as to whether or not that's accurate. For many of us, there's a disconnect between what a state agency might relay to a legislator um, and not because they're, you know, trying to you know, be misleading or anything, but that's just what they hear, okay? Um, and the legislators need to understand how that comes full circle and impacts families. Um, you know, I have this lived experience of being a parent. I can tell you it's impossible to find a caregiver. <laughs> um, you know, I have a law degree, so I understand how this law was made. Um, my family uses care, has used caregiver for many years. We experiencing the following problems. Um, you know, another way to show your power is if you work outside the home, a lot of us have had to quit our jobs to be sole caregivers um, for, for our kids with disabilities, but I'm fortunate enough that I get to work outside the home as well. Um, so I get to say I'm the director of public policy for the Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, I hear from families all over the state about the problems that they're experiencing and I have a duty to make sure that you hear um, about those problems. I help families every week who cannot access their communities because of language barriers or transportation barriers, uh, financial barriers, whatever the issue is. You are the collector of these stories and these lived experiences. And it's so critical that we funnel back and, and reflect those back to the policymakers who have a hand in creating some of these barriers. Okay, so legitimize and synthesize your power. State the problem 
ideally with some precision. Okay, our problem is that schools are closed and no services are being provided to our kids. That means my kid is experiencing regression. My kid is experiencing, um, you know, behavior issues because he can't communicate and isn't advancing um, along with his peers. My kid can't see his peers. Um, and so there's a lot of social emotional regression happening. We struggle to find, hire, and retain caregivers who are willing to work for minimum wage. Um, the problem is we don't have enough funding to create accessible voting booths. These are just examples, okay? But just trying to identify the problem with some precision will help the legislator or elected official that you're talking to um, will help orient them um, to the problem and start thinking about ways to address or solve it. Describe what happens if the problem persists or doesn't go unsolved or goes unsolved. Um, you know, if I can't hire a caregiver, I can't work outside the home to earn a living. That's a huge problem. And just breaking it down as simply as that, um, you know, is, is really critical for um, elected officials to hear. Um, you know, for, for many of us, if we don't have caregivers, we can't leave the house with, um, you know, or, or, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to leave um, with an untrained caregiver, a caregiver that we, a new caregiver that, because we have so much turnover, they only make minimum wage. So we've got a new person that we're constantly training and we, it's hard to trust caregivers, especially with a lot of our loved ones who are nonverbal and they can't tell us if something bad has happened to them. Um, if we cannot communicate with people in their language, children and families go without services. I, I'm working with a group right now who um, has language barrier issues and um, you know, trying to get things in, in the languages of, of the communities that they serve is a real challenge. And if you can't even effectively communicate um, with folks about the services that exist, that's a real problem, right? Um, so there's some other examples of just describing what happens if the problem persists. You know, if this law rules unchanged, children will continue to go without an education. Whatever it is, just think that through. Come with your own solution or your ideas for a solution. Okay, your, your idea for a solution could be if you would just throw another billion dollars um, at this program, that would uh, shore things up for us. That would make things better. <laughs> um, but if you're a budget writer right now in Washington state at least, um, and we're experiencing you know, budget shortfalls, that's going to be a non-starter for you finding a billion dollars. Um, for, for most people anyway. So um, I like to start with the uh, sentence of, we think this will get, get better if. We think we could do better if. Um, you know, whether it's you, if you vote for a bill or um, you fund this or you do this, um, asking people to start the power of what, you know, we think you could do better if um, is a really great way to uh, get people thinking about how to make things better. Um, these barriers are eliminated when you, when you mandate that caregivers are paid a living wage, you know, then we don't have so much turnover. Um, I can get somebody in my home that I trust and I can go work outside the home, whatever it is. In our experiencing providing accommodations and all voting booths increases participation. Um, so, you know, putting it back on the elected official to, um, to take your solution and run with it um, is, is the ideal thing. And then finally, leaving the door open to um, follow up is really, really helpful. Um, because you are the subject matter expert of your own story, um, then um, you can offer to be a resource to elected officials, okay? Um, if they don't um, if you, if they ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, letting them know, I look forward to, you know, I will get back to you with an answer to this question after I research it. 
I love it when legislators ask me questions that I don't know the answer to. Um, the first reason I love it is because it gives me the opportunity to come back and talk to them again, to make yet another pitch about why this um, issue or this program is important to me and to the families that I serve. Um, it also shows that you are gonna follow through and do what you say you're going to do. Um, so that's an important thing to establish with elected officials at all levels and not the least of which are legislators. Becoming a source of information um, for legislative offices, especially the, in the districts that you live is absolutely critical and letting them know that you are available anytime to, um, to educate them on, uh, any, you know, on these issues in particular is super um, important. So I love it when legislators ask me questions I don't know the answer to. I get to go research um, whatever the issue is and make sure that I'm getting them accurate information. And it's a lot of times information that um, they wouldn't otherwise receive because I'm able to reach out to families, I'm able to get it from, you know, agencies or, or other sources that the legislator might not um, have thought about, okay? Um, so um, with that, I just want to stop there. I've just given you kind of a six-step formula that you should um, use and create as your own. Uh, for how to talk to uh, legislators. And Megan, I just wanna give an opportunity for anybody in the chat box um, who may have popped a question in there to answer it. Um, I haven't seen any questions Daniel pop up in either chat Daniel yet, so. Great, okay. Um, great. You can go well, ahead and continue. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that this work is important but there's a lot of barriers that are seen and unseen to success, okay? If this work was easy, um, you know, everybody would be doing it and everybody would be having a lot of success, but that's just not true. Um, a lot of us struggle. And I just wanna talk a little bit about what I like to think of as the advocacy iceberg, okay? And if we think of an iceberg, there is what is seen there's the issues that are seen, and then there's the issues that are not seen, okay? Um, so uh, below the surface, we deal every day with a lot of issues. And this isn't just in the arena of legislative advocacy, but um, it's you know dealing with case managers or dealing with school personnel or dealing with whomever. Um, there are these issues that we all deal with and struggle with, okay? From sexism, racism, capitalism, ableism, classism, ignorance, uh, willful or blissful, like there's challenges, you know, from each of, from, from all of those um, issues. And they're all kind of uh, coming at the iceberg um, and, and shaping it under the waters, okay? Um, so I just want to acknowledge all of those issues. Um, I've been personally affected by them um, in one way, shape, or form, and I know each of you uh, watching has as well. And so um, there are a lot of challenges that we face and experience just in, in getting out of bed every day and, and coming up and doing this work or any work, to be perfectly honest with you. So I get the enormity of what I'm asking families and disabled people to do when I ask you to join this work, okay? Um, so, I, um, so there are, I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen for just a, just a second um, and go to some hyperlinks that I have in here. Um, oops. Um, so a lot of times, I, and my colleagues over at the Ark of Washington State did a fabulous job of creating a video 
Am I still sharing my screen, Megan? No. Okay, great. Um, so my colleagues over at the Ark of Washington did a fabulous job of creating a video that um, is uh, really, really great. For, uh, it's a great small little um, tutorial on how to go to the legislature and participate in advocacy work, okay? And I love this video and they did a fabulous job at it. And so I'm gonna show the video and then I'm gonna talk about how it fits into um, our work here in just a second. Hold on just one second. Sharing my screen. There's so much to get right in all this technical stuff. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Diana Stadden with the Ark of Washington State. And I'm Jessica River from Tom Advocates Leadership, and I'll be the street device for this video. We're here to talk to you about how to become a trusted resource for legislators on issues that affect your life. Even though your elected officials represent you, they can't do this very well if they don't know what you want. That's right. With so many topics for legislators to learn about, your knowledge of developmental disabilities helps them to do their job. You are the expert in telling your story and how it relates to decisions they are making. Here are some tips to help you make the most impact. Your time with legislators, staff, or aides is short, and your message should be too. When you communicate, sum up what the issue is and why it's important to you. Have a specific request related to a bill or budget item. Attack the problem, not the person. And follow up with a thank you. If you're not sure what to talk about, visit arcwa.org slash advocacy for issue summaries, as well as a list of bills and budget proposals. If a legislator asks for information you don't have, like data or charts, it's not only okay to say you don't know, it's the very best response to give. You can always follow up by contacting the Ark of Washington State or ask another advocacy organization for the answers. By doing this, you greatly increase your credibility and strengthen your legislative relationships. Bottom line, stick to what you know, which is your life and how the issue affects you. There are lots of ways to let lawmakers know what you think. You can send a message by email. Call the toll-free legislative hotline at 866-562-6000. Phone your legislator directly. Schedule a virtual meeting with your legislator. Chat with your legislator's legislative assistant. Testify at a hearing. Attend a legislative forum or town hall meeting. Because of the pandemic, almost all legislative advocacy will be done remotely for the foreseeable future. To set up a meeting with a legislator, email their office to schedule an online appointment through Zoom. Meeting times are limited to about 15 minutes. You don't need a Zoom account, but you will need to download the Zoom app or use a browser. Your legislator's aide will provide you the link. For Zoom tips, visit arqua.org. Remember, be polite and respectful to legislative assistants who act as gatekeepers to your legislator's busy schedules. You may find that they have a family member or close friend who's affected by the same issues you face. A good relationship with them can make a big difference. For remote testimony, visit the committee schedules page at app.leg.wa.gov slash committee schedules. Select remote testimony for where the bill is being heard, House or Senate, and follow the instructions. Because remote testimony is so new, these steps may change. If you need help to testify on a bill, 
call or email the Legislative Information Center at 360-786-7573 or support at ledge.wad.gov. If you don't want to testify, you can still make comments on the bill for the committee to consider. To do this, visit the bill's page and select Comment on this bill and follow the directions. Don't forget about social media. A lot of legislators have accounts on Facebook and Twitter, where you can comment or watch live stream chats and virtual town halls. It's so important to stay informed and involved. Participate in virtual advocacy days. Sign up for the ARC's action alerts. Get updates at arcwad.org and follow us on Facebook. Connect with local parent and self-advocate groups. For more information, check out our Hot Tips publication on our advocacy page at arcwa.org, available in English or Spanish. And remember, change is made by those who show up. Okay, so I love that. They did such a fabulous job. Those are my colleagues, Diana Stadden and Jessica Renner. Um, over at the Ark of Washington State. Um, I think there's actually an Ark chapter in every state as well. Um, uh, and uh, local chapters, and then they've got a state chapter. So if you're uh, listening to this outside of Washington State, um, definitely look them up, even in Washington State. If you're not already connected with your local Ark chapter, I highly recommend it. Um, and um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. Okay, so the reason I show this video and I do it first is because um, I put this video and everything that goes with it at the, at the last number 10 in the iceberg, okay? And so I wanna talk about all the work that goes on underneath that, um, even nine and then below the surface, um, uh, one through eight. Okay, I just wanna talk about that really quickly. And again, um, acknowledging all of the issues that surround um, the iceberg of advocacy um, that are seen and unseen, okay? So before we get all the way down to that final step in number 10, there's a lot of work here to, um, to shore up, to button up um, and to do before um, if we're gonna, if we're really gonna get our feet wet on advocacy, in advocacy, there's a lot of work to do before we get to that last and final step. So the first question I want to know, and this is just a hypothetical of, in Washington State, we don't allow parents of um, kids under the age of 18 to be paid care providers. That's not true in um, other states. Other states allow parents um, to be paid care providers um, uh, to their underage kids. And so um, if we're just gonna uh, thread an issue through what it would look like to do some advocacy around this, um, you know, we'd start with the issue of, okay, we want parents to be paid um, for their work. This makes a lot of sense because if you're gonna, if, if otherwise you say, okay, well, parent, you need to, uh, now you can't participate in the work uh, force at all, um, and you've got to rely on a pool of caregivers who are paid minimum wage and who are turning over, you know, roughly every month. Um, that can be very difficult uh, for families, and so a lot of families want to be able to provide paid care uh, to their younger child. So where does the rule live? Is it, uh, is it something that the, the Developmental Disabilities Administration says it can't happen? Um, or, or does it live in a, in a state, does, is it, does it live in a state law or a federal rule? That's the first question you're going to want to ask is who's telling you no and from what authority do they have to tell you no? Um, and then I ask, okay, what'll happen if we change the rule or the law? Are there any unintended consequences? Um, so for instance, in this example, um, I believe there's a federal law that says, okay, well, the paid care provider cannot also be the representative payee. And so, um, okay, are there unintended consequences that we would have to think through there? 
this is just a hypothetical, okay? You can do this with any problem. Um, this is just a formulaic analysis that you can, um, you can go through to kind of figure out, okay, you know, how do I get to the root of this? This will help you, going through this analysis will help you craft your own solution to take to a legislator to say, okay, here's what I think um, the problem is and here's how I think we can go about solving it. Um, I ask who else is experiencing the problem. Um, try and get other groups of people together to see if you can agree um, to ask as a, as a group for decision makers to change the rule or the law for you. Um, same thing if you're just asking for a budget request and not any policy changes. Um, it's always good to ask and try and figure out who would be opposed to this change and try and um, understand their opposition before you go to a policymaker. Um, and uh, that's just a best practice thing to do. Um, ask what sort of power, um, and power as we know is derived from time, money, and people. Um, uh, that you and your allies have um, and, and how about the people who oppose the change? I, I like to do a, a quick analysis of, okay, you know, does this person, does this other group have a lot of money? <laughs> um, that's typically what it is. Another group just has a lot of money that they can throw at a problem um, that, uh, so it'll make, make it difficult for me to, to get to a solution. Um, and then I ask, does this proposal require a campaign? You know, a marketing campaign, um, you know, takes a lot of time and money as well. And those are going to be, uh, you know, you'll want to answer that question before you get started as well. Um, and then also just understanding um, legislative hierarchies and, um, uh, you know, who, who makes sense um, to ask to help you with your legislative, um, um, with your proposed solution, there should be some thought and analysis that goes into that as well. But you don't wanna do this work alone. You wanna find a group of people, especially if you're doing it for the first time. This is really overwhelming and daunting. If you're doing that, if you're, if you're seeing this analysis for the first time. That's why we recommend getting involved in a group. Um, in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just to share stories with other families um, or get connected in some way. Okay, so Megan, I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions. Um, there's just a comment that the ARC did a really great job and uh, we wish it was captioned. <laughs> there are no questions at this point on either feed. Okay, great, perfect. Um, the the that she wishes that this, um, that our training was captioned? Um, that she was mentioning the video, um, but however, on a side note, we are looking at adding uh, a, a caption to our webinars in the future so that Great. when we have okay. presenters, people will be able oh, to have I, the captions. Okay, yeah, I thought that the ARC video was captioned. Maybe I was wrong. Um, I apologize. And we are trying to, yeah, we're the DDC is also trying to get captions for these trainings as well. Um, so um, great, thank you for that feedback. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start tying these things together. Again, um, it's important to explain um, how telling your story um, can and does become a law. I've got Senator Claire Wilson here out of the 30th Legislative District, who I'm going to bring up to help share that. What advice do I give advocates who want to help change an existing law or implement a new law? I think the most important thing you can do is tell your story. If something is important to you, if it's impacting you, if you are negatively uh, affected by a decision or find something that's not working for you in your community, for your children, for yourself, for your families. The most important thing you can do is let somebody know. And you don't have to know uh, in details. You don't have to know technological things. What you need to be able to do is tell your story. Uh, tell your story and tell your story about why and tell your story about what and tell your story about how, and tell your story about who you are. And your story could be a good story about how things are working and how you want it to work for other people, 
Or your story could be about a challenge or something that isn't working for you or something that's broken that needs to be fixed. And um, that's the most important thing because I think it's putting a face and a name and a story to an issue is what keeps legislators uh, remembering why they're there and uh, how important their votes are. And things are not words on a paper, things are uh, people. And uh, the things we're working on impact um, children and families every single day. So my best advice is to be you and to tell stories and to share your story and to not be afraid um, or not think what you have to say isn't important because each of us has a story to tell. And each of those stories will take us one step further into either changing a law that exists or maybe starting a new law that no one's ever thought about before that's going to help someone um, beyond yourself. So stories, stories, stories. That's what I'll say. Okay, again, thank you so much. Uh, shout out to Senator Wilson for helping uh, drive home the point that um, sharing your stories with legislators is super critical. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to make sure that um, I really like this, uh, this uh, stating your barriers in a way that um, also sets you up for delivering your solution. Um, so telling legislators, we think we could do better if. Um, that mean, you know, have, and then having a solution on the end of that is really critical because that solution, they want to implement solutions that are coming from the community that most people can agree with. Um, so making sure that, again, you're collaborating with other groups and other people um, to try and come up with a solution that you'd like to present to a legislator um, is, is most effective. Also know that you have to be persistent um, in this journey, in this work. Uh, this just shows this is a statistical summary that most bills do not make it into law. In 2019, there were 2,200 bills, over 2,200 bills introduced into the legislature um, and only 467 of those were enacted. 469 passed and 467 were acted, enacted. Um, so it's, it's important to understand that this isn't um, you know, a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination um, that you're gonna get a bill through, but um, you've gotta show up and at least try, okay? Um, I'm gonna go through this just really quickly. Um, uh, sorry, the um, thinking too about, um, about decision makers and the influences that they experience um, from both, you know, campaign contributions and voters are also going to impact your ability to be successful. Um, and I go through this in other um, uh, trainings, but the influence of money in, into politics is, is real. Um, and so that's a really big reason why we have to coalesce as a community to show up and reflect back to legislators um, the barriers that we, their constituents, are experiencing um, in their district and, um, and remind them that, uh, that we are voters um, that are uh, electing them to their, um, to their offices, okay? So I'm just gonna go really quickly through that. Um, I've got a whole other training on um, the politics of politics if folks are interested in discussing that further. So I just wanna, um, we're coming to the end of this and I just wanna make a pitch to discuss our own, any barriers to participation and advocacy and education that you might be feeling. Um, first of all, I wanna talk about the fact that they're all super normal. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, it, not the least of which we're in a global pandemic and a lot of us are experiencing, you know, financial stressors that we weren't before and so on. But even before that, there's technology barriers, just a general fear, um, feeling like you don't have the knowledge to get involved and stay involved um, in advocacy, you don't maybe feel motivated to do it. 
um, you might be experiencing, you or your family member might be experiencing health issues and problems. I know that, you know, for me, my, uh, when my kid is in the hospital, then there is no advocacy going on. <laughs> um, so um, I just want to acknowledge that. And then a lot of us also experience barriers, um, you know, with transportation or financial or otherwise. Um, so this is an obviously a comprehensive list of barriers that people might be facing, um, but it's certainly a lot of the big ones. Um, so our last uh, video comes from a legislative assistant um, actually our second to last video, uh, comes from a legislative assistant who works in Olympia and she's going to talk about ways to be successful when you come and talk to a state legislator, um, down in Olympia and things to remember. I'm Sarah. I'm oh. Am I, am I sharing that Megan? Can you see my screen? No, that you're you're not screen sharing. Thank you. Assistant, and I'm here. To Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm okay, Senator Emily is. Randall's legislative assistant, and I'm here to talk to you about three things that advocates should know when they're visiting our office down in Olympia. The first thing I really want to start out with is that it's it's okay to feel intimidated, but we really want to do as much as we can to make sure you don't feel um, intimidated and scared when you visit us. We're here to help you and we want to know what's most important to you. Um, you're the backbone of our work and we want to make sure that your voices are heard every day. Um, and your voices inform our work. So don't be intimidated. You have the power um, to impact change and you are the ones that will help um, ensure that we um, are best meeting the needs of our neighbors throughout the legislative process. So don't be intimidated. You're awesome. And we thank you every time you're coming and even thinking about visiting. Um, the second thing that I'd say is that sometimes if the legislature can be a large place and there's security in some places or you just can't find where you're going and I always want to caution that you can just call us or ask someone um, where we are you can say hey I spoke to Sarah or um, you know some other member of our office and they'll help um, pinpoint you to the right direction and make sure you're able to get where you need to go. And so don't be afraid to ask for directions. The security, um, security is really nice and they'll help you get where you need to go. And if not, we'll come to you. Um, we do that a lot where we just go and, and meet with constituents in hallways and by the wings or even outside. So don't be um, intimidated by security or the large building. We're here for you and we wanna make sure that we're able to go, go help you wherever you are. The third thing is, I know it's been a little bit of a transition um, for our offices to be no longer accepting paper, but I do want to also caution that um, although we're not accepting paper and you know physically, we'll still take it and scan it or we'll take a picture of it and we'll still make sure that your hard work that you put into bringing that paper to us and working on that paper is still um, a good way of uh, ensuring that your message comes across and we're still gonna uh, find, uh, find a way to get that information into our system. Um, and it's perfectly fine to come to our office with paper. We'll just probably take a picture or scan it or run off for a minute to go take it to the copier. Um, nothing too big of a change. We're just making sure that we're um, complying with all the laws that we have. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was Sarah, who is a legislative assistant to Senator Emily Randall. She's fabulous. Thank you, Sarah, for um, helping us to, to orient us to Olympia. She's um, really uh, great at helping people with disabilities as well and trying to figure out where they need to go. Um, okay, so am I still sharing, uh, Megan? Not your screen, no. Well. There we go. 
Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Um, great. So typically when I'm doing this in person, um, we are doing role plays and sometimes I have legislators come and do uh, you know, office appointments as a role play or what have you. We obviously can't do that as a um, in a webinar, but I did just want to kind of put it all together for you um, in terms of reaching out to the offices. So, you know, to begin with, you call or email the legislator's office, explain why you want to speak with the legislator, um, make sure that you live in their district, or at least you understand why you're calling them if you don't live in their district. Um, you know, schedule a date and a place, show up to meet, take a buddy, especially if they also care about your issue and live in the same district, tell your story, you're the expert of your experience, ask for help and follow up. Okay. Um, I have just a few more minutes here and typically I like to go through and um, talk about why you should uh, run for office. Um, or, or consider getting involved in, um, in the legislature or any, any level of elected leadership, especially for people with disabilities and their families. I'm really passionate about trying to get you all involved because you understand the barriers um, so acutely. And um, it's important that those of us who um, understand the barriers can uh, be a voice for people with disabilities and their families um, on the outside. So um, I want to um, uh, though check in with you, Megan, and make sure there's no questions that um, need to be answered. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat or on Facebook. So I think we are still good to go. Great. OK, well, um, I've invited again Senator Claire Wilson um, to talk about why um, she became a legislator and again to also plant a bug in your ear to try and um, get you to think about it too. So bear with me for just a second. I'm going to pull this up. Can you see it? Why did I? Yes. Is it coming? Great. Okay. Become a legislator. Well, I think um, I've been working in the field with kids and families for 35 years. And all those years, I would bring families down to Olympia to advocate for needs that they had and things that were not happening and challenges they had related to supports for themselves and their families. And so one of the things that happened was coming to the legislature really allowed me an opportunity to say to people, you don't have to convince me about what the problem is. What you need to do is let's talk about solutions so we can finally make the changes that we've been looking for for so, so long. So instead of people making changes for you or without you, that you become the solution and can really share what's important to you and what solutions to the challenges that are happening within your communities and your families look like. So um, that's why I decided to become a legislator and hopefully I'm doing the right thing and I'm listening to not only my constituents but to others whose needs are not being met and we can make the changes uh, that we know need to happen, uh, especially um, in days and in times uh, like we're having right now. Okay, fabulous. So, um, uh, so then, uh, okay, my last, my last slide here. This is really exciting. We're getting to the end. Um, I want to know what would it take for you to run for office and um, and take your stories that you've been uh, that you've. Um, now feel confident in telling to legislators, taking those stories and um, and and being an effective uh, legislator. Maybe you run for school board or you know run for something else. But um, thinking about taking your lived experience and experiences and um, running for a local office, uh, I would love to entertain any questions that anybody might have along that line um, or about anything that you, that we've discussed today. And um, I hope this has been helpful. Um, and please let me know if I can be a resource um, for you now or, or anytime in the future. 
So Megan, I know there haven't been any burning questions thus far, but maybe people will feel more comfortable asking them now. There is there is one burning question that's sort of tangentially related. Um, Riley wants to ask about advocacy in schools as a sibling. Um, let me, I can turn him on and let him talk so he can ask the question yeah, directly, great. would that be okay? okay? Yeah, totally, of course. Okay, Riley, go ahead and um, unmute and ask your question. Hey, Adrian. Uh, Hi, Riley, good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, like when I was, because Leah and I, my sister, she, sh uh, she and I shared a year in high school together. And a lot of times it felt like I was kind of like my, like a spy for my parents at the school, kind of keeping an eye on her. Um, but there was a lot of times that it felt like uh, I'd come in and check on my sister and there'd be times like where it didn't really seem like she was being uh, involved or something was going wrong and they didn't know what was going on and I'd come in and help out. But yeah. there's, there's quite a, there's some times where uh, it felt like uh, my suggestions weren't being taken into consideration because I was a student. I was a lot of times assumed I didn't know exactly what I was talking about or it just kind of felt like they weren't listening. Um, yeah. What are ways, like even if, because I'm not in school with her anymore, uh, but in the event that there is, like I end up getting the question of what can I do to uh, build, like have them listen and stuff, where would that start? Well, great question, Riley. I think that, um, you know, we have the unique experience of going through school um, as a sibling, as a sibling who isn't receiving special education services um, in the schools. And, um, and we also are, we feel um, th this is somebody that we love, right, who's in another classroom or, um, you know, is in, in another program, even another building or what have you. Um, you know, I think the first thing, and I, I can just speak for me, okay, there's no rule book on this stuff. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, Leah has, or sorry, your sister, I didn't mean to use her name. Um, uh, your sister has an IEP team or an IEP, uh, which is a contract basically with the school to say, okay, you know, in order for her to be successful, she needs the following supports. Well, in Washington state and in many other states, actually, a lot of times um, students with disabilities are placed in segregated settings. Um, they're taken out of the general education setting and they're put in, you know, rooms or hallways down the hall or portables out back or sent to different schools or buildings or what have you um, so that they're away from their neurotypical uh, friends and peers and um, you know, that's, that's really problematic. That's not how special, special education is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a list of services that are available to students who need them in order to be academically successful. Um, so I think, um, you know, for siblings, I, you know, I think there it's a hard deal because you don't um, want to ask all siblings to be responsible for ensuring that they're uh, brother or sister is getting the IEP services that they are entitled to under the law, um, and at the same time, you kind of want to be, you know, involved um, in a way that makes sense, um, you know, for for her and and for you. Um, you obviously don't want your own academic success to be jeopardized because you're trying to monitor what's going on in the classroom um, with your sister. Um, so it might make sense for a sibling to be on an IEP team and the IEP um, team can call meetings to discuss, you know, a variety of things, um, to discuss if supports are working. I remember when I was in elementary school, I went in and read books to Haley, to my, to Haley my sister's class, all the way through elementary school. That was a way for me to um, you know, see my sister on a regular basis. Again, she was segregated. This was, you know, almost 40 years ago. We still do the same thing. 
today, right, we completely segregate kids with disabilities. Um, and, and that's not how it's supposed to be, but that's what's, that's the practice. Um, and so, you know, I went in and I read books um, to her class and because I really wanted to see her um, throughout the day. Um, so that made sense. It was really age appropriate and it fit with, you know, what the classroom teacher needed. I wasn't a burden to the classroom. I wasn't a burden to the paraeducators trying to support the students in the classroom, et cetera. So, I mean, to answer your question, I think there's a lot of ways to go about it, but just, you know, generally trying to be helpful and seeing what makes sense and understanding the role that the school, the role, the obligation that the school has to your sister and making sure that you're not um, impeding with that, I think is, would be the first thing I would recommend. Is that helpful? Yeah, that actually is helpful. Great. What other questions? Anything else? I suppose along those lines, I have a question. As far as integration goes, that seems to be a very uphill battle pretty much everywhere. Um, for those of us with kids who are preschool or just entering school or, or I guess anytime during school, what would you say is the best way for us to start tackling that issue? Oh my gosh, we don't have enough time for me to draw out a battle plan. Um, okay. But trust me, this is this issue is near and dear to my heart. Yes. Um, and but let me tell you what I have done. Uh, when um, first of all, legislators, policymakers don't know about this issue. There is a lot of education that needs to take place. Okay, there's a lot of people out there who are like, oh, we have this developmental preschool um, over here for the kids with disabilities. And that's where we segregate them starting at three years old, right? And we, and we groom families and people with disabilities to believe that they need to be in this segregated setting. But that's an artificial setting that is being created based on funding models, okay? And legislators, a lot of them don't know this. And so there's a lot of education that has to happen. So again, going back through the slides and saying, it's my experience actually that my kid was only offered a segregated setting. Um, all the science says that, you know, being around neurotypical peers, kids that don't have learning disabilities, kids that don't have speech delays, um, is not only great for my kid, but it's great for those other kids too, to be exposed to neurodiverse kids, to see kids um, that are using wheelchairs, to see kids that are using G-tubes, um, to see kids that are, that are getting along in life differently. I mean, we need to start at three years old, right, when the, right out of the gate to say, here's the range of normal. Here is the human lived experience, okay? That three-year-old becomes uh, a 22-year-old graduating from college that, that who, who then goes out into the workforce and expects to see disabled people working alongside them. We don't have that now. Right now, if I go out into the job workplace and I see a person using a wheelchair, it's the only person in the building using a wheelchair. It is a novel thing um, to see my coworkers using a G-tube, using a wheelchair, what using an assistance device. Um, and, and that's just not how it is. That's just a matter, the, the reason that is the case is because that most people, especially people with significant disabilities aren't working. They are in the shadows of poverty, right? And, and we start that track at three years old because we, we take those kids with disabilities and we put them in the, in the portable outback. We put them in the room down the street. We put them in the different school. We don't offer services to them at all. So in Washington state, and I think this is the same thing in other states, um, there are programs such as like ECAP or Head Start 
where they're not, the schools aren't going to tell you this because it's not in their, and it's not in their financial interest to do so, but they are supposed to reserve slots in ECAP and Head Start for kids with disabilities. And, um, and, and that is considered uh, a least restrictive environment right when you've got kids with dis without disabilities coming into the same classroom so so we you know you've got these like school personnel administrators um and they're just doing what they can because of budgets or what have you you know but um saying okay well the poor kids go here the disabled kids go here and the rich non-disabled kids go here we are creating we are allowing those um, tracks to start at three years old. And it's indefensible. So what I say is that you've got to push and you've got to push at three. Um, I, uh, you know, had the own, my own struggle with Charlie that I've been really public about because I want other people to understand the importance of why it is I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, and, uh, and I had to, I had to file a citizen's complaint and take it up to OSPI, um, who, you know, they themselves, they themselves aren't good at, uh, you know, enforcing all of the laws, right? There's a lot that school districts, um, get away with, um, um, for, for a variety of reasons. And so you really have to be the watchdog here and say, that's great, my kid has a disability, but I understand that there are slots available um, in, in, to be put into classrooms for kids with kids who don't have disabilities. And I am requesting a one-on-one -on -one paraeducator to go and support my kid um, to help them be successful in a general education, least restrictive environment. In our state, um, and again, this is you know different state to state, but you know we don't have compulsory education until age eight. Um, but if you are going to provide a general education setting, you know, to other kids, um, then you need to make it accessible um, to kids with disabilities and follow that state law. So you don't have to follow federal law basically until you're taking federal funding. Um, so, and there's really funding, you know, complicated funding formulas, but basically they don't have to start um, giving you a, a least restrictive environment in a general education setting until kindergarten. Um, and, but I think it's important to start pushing for it at age three, you know, right now, even with Charlie, my three-year-old, uh, right now uh, there's, there, you know, they keep, and cause they've used COVID as an excuse to come back and say, okay, well, we only have this segregated environment to offer him. Um, so I've got him in a private daycare to get him socialized. Uh, with his neurotypical peers, um, because it cost me more in attorney's fees to fight it <laughs> um, than it does, and then it does for me to just stick him in a daycare. To be honest with you, um, it's and this is exactly why I am trying to get other uh, people on board because I can't change the system myself. You know, I we you know my family doesn't have unlimited resources um, to go fight you know, all these fights. So it's really so much more powerful when we can come together and tackle these problems um, as, as groups and as a collective voice. Is that helpful, Megan, at all? I can yes, definitely very go helpful. on. Okay. <laughs> yes, no, very helpful. Um, okay. So what, it, I mean, that sounds like to me is that some of the best ways to get involved there is maybe to look for um, like in your presentation, the the coalitions and the, the friends and family and, and yeah. people who are also in that same boat who need to make that change. Right, right. And, um, you know, for specifics, I know there's, um, I've also used the COPA before to help me advocate um, for a least restrictive environment. A COPA is a uh, well, I can spell out the acronym and put it on the website, but um, but those are they they aren't necessarily attorneys, but they're a lot of times also fellow parents who understand the shenanigans um, that schools use to try and get out of delivering services to kids with disabilities. 
Um, and a lot of times they know more laws um, than the people that are on, are on the IEP team making um, IEP high stakes IEP decisions um, and, and then following up and helping to enforce you know, some of the IEP. Things. So for specifics, you know, that's like on an individual level to help your kid. But the problem is, is that the system is completely broken. You know, there's 140,000 kids with disabilities just in our state alone. And we are being forced to individually go and fight a system. Um, and, uh, and that's not effective. It's not an efficient thing to do. And it's not going to help all kids. Yeah, maybe, you know, my kid gets the least restrictive environment, but that's not the point. You know, the point is that, you know, we need to make it better for everybody. Great yeah. question. Um, one other question with all of the right points and directions and videos on your slideshow, is that an available resource that we'll be able to share with folks? Um, I know absolutely that I like to, to read it and go to through and yeah totally <laughs> totally and okay. um yeah so I'll give you um I'm happy to send along the slide deck my main request is that you show it and share it with other community groups who share our values who are interested in promoting independence for people with disabilities and their families um and who are interested in getting involved in advocacy so yeah thanks yeah I'm happy to share that as a resource for you Okay, yeah, I'd like to be able to print it and take my own notes because there was a lot of information on there. There's a lot. It's really dense and there's hyperlinks in there and all that good stuff. So yeah, please, uh, please use it. Yeah, yeah, use it with your group. Thank you. And I'm happy to come back and, and do this again or sh I have you show it again to do it, you know, maybe a different training or what have you. And I would love to be a resource. Um, so follow up with any questions that you don't feel comfortable asking right now in a big group. Okay, um, there's one more, um, it's more of a comment um, from a lady named Janae who said, districts seem to be using the remote learning environment as an excuse not to provide free and appropriate education here and they're not following IEPs and they're filing a complaint with the state over it. Excellent, great, yep, keep doing it. Um, the state has rewritten the rules to say that remote education is totally fine and it counts as a basic education. Um, and, um, you know, as school districts are also getting to collect what's called a special education multiplier uh, for kids with disabilities who are sitting at home, because now that's been redefined as a general education setting. Um, so the schools have little incentive to actually offer in-person services to kids, and they sure as heck aren't being held accountable to do so. Um, so please, yes, use, use the complaint process um, I, you know, don't expect too much to come from it, but um, keep piping up, reach out, let me know how I can connect you with other groups and, and services who are fighting this issue as well. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible um, time for kids with disabilities and their families. So I see you. Yes, well, I, um, I don't see any more questions or comments in our chat or in our so okay. I think that will probably end our, our presentation okay. for now. Thank you so much, Adrienne. We really, really appreciate your presentation um, and we look forward to sharing it and your slide deck and reaching out probably um, too much and getting more no, information from you to, Please do. to share. So Please do. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. Take good care. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.